Good afternoon, radio listeners, and welcome to the news behind the news with Ralph Kentav on Mix ninety four point seven FM. Today, I'm gonna have well, we're gonna have quite a, a political conversation. I have here with me for the first time, Member of Parliament Melissa Gums and the leader of the Party for Progress. Good afternoon, Melissa, and welcome to the program. Good afternoon, Ralph. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for having me. Okay, great. It's good to have you on um, as a new MP. Uh, we have quite a lot to talk about, but. Um, before we get into some serious topics, uh, I'd like you to share a bit about yourself. Um, I think you're still, a, in a sense, kind of a mystery. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm still a mystery. Tell right. us about your background, <laughs> you know, some of your, your work history. Um, so about Melissa, more beyond being Marcel Gum's daughter. Sure. Uh, yeah, um, I was born and raised here in St. Martin. I uh, did my schooling locally at uh, St. Dominic High School, but primary and high school. And then I uh, went away to Miami um, to further my studies. After doing a year here at USM, actually, because uh, when I graduated, uh, because of my birthday, you know, I was 16. And, uh, you know, my parents were like, hold on now. <laughs> so I did a year at USM um, and transferred out when I was 17 to St. Thomas University in Miami. It's a small uh, Catholic university. Um, you know, considered a private institution. Yeah, quite a bit of people studied yeah. there. Yeah, at the time it was one of those schools that had sort of like a FAMU agreement um, with, uh, with the Martin. government. Still mm -hmm. does, actually. Um, so, it, yeah, it was the obvious choice. I did my bachelor's in business administration and then followed up with my master's in international business with a focus on international marketing and communications uh, at STU. And, uh, yeah, graduated December 2006, moved back home uh, where I returned to Sinesta Maho Beach Resort and Casino because that was my summer job when okay. I would come home during the summers. Uh, so worked under Bernard Hunt, uh, who was the sales director at the time as a group sales manager. Learned a lot about the tourism industry, hospitality in general, and uh, you know how uh, St. Martin could position itself um, um, with its stay over tourism product. Uh, travel to represent the um, property and the country essentially at various market shows. And uh, in 2009, I decided I wanted a change. Um, I'd been back home for three years, and I decided I was going to move to the Netherlands to see, you know, what that would be like. Uh, funny enough, my dad originally wanted me to do my master's in Holland, mm. but I chose to stay in Miami because I, I liked it. I liked the school. It's still, you know, you get a good education while still having a personal touch because the class sizes are not like, you know, yeah. you, people know your name. The teachers know your name, basically. Um, so I moved to the Netherlands where I worked for TMF Group, which is a uh, global trust company. I also participated in the communications rollout for their merger with Equity Trust, uh, which, you know, you hear me talk a lot about in Parliament because I learned a lot about uh, global finance and, um, and finance in general uh, while working there. Um, while there in 2011 with Cyril Fennings, I co-founded uh, Unified St. Martin Connection, mm -hmm. uh, which was a student foundation aimed at helping St. Martin students, uh, you know, acclimate to um, Dutch culture, to the culture shock of, of being in a European country while doing your yeah. tertiary studies. Was it much of a big shock for you when, when you, were, when you um, left uh, St. To Martin? Go to, to, to go to the yeah. Netherlands or to go to college? To go to the Netherlands. It was. I mean... Um, I'd been hearing about it, you know, uh, from my parents, their travel, my cousins from Aruba as well, you know, all went to school in the Netherlands. Um, so for, for me, it was just, you know, what is it going to be like on the working side? And um, yeah, I, I enjoyed it, but it did take some getting used to. At the same time, you know, students who go up there f um, from St. Martin have a, have a, a unique challenge. Uh, I think any, any child, any person that travels for um, academics or whatever, uh, you know, you face certain challenges. But, you know, in the States, we're almost a little in a bubble. Yeah. You have your dorm yeah. room. You know where your meals are coming from because yeah. you have your board and room and board agreement with the cafeteria. Uh, it's kind of relaxed. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of relaxed. Yeah. You know, you don't have to worry about paying the light bill or any kind of bill, no rent. But in Holland, you're a full-fledged adult. Yeah. You're taken from coming home to mommy's lunch, you know, every day to how do I, you know, make pasta? <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually a question that I got um, when we had uh, an event at USC. You have a lot of students that go up not really knowing how to do these things. Correct. And um, we wanted to uh, help make the transition as easy as possible. Yeah. So I, I, I'm so glad that you said that because um, I remember when I left, I was right after Irma. Yeah. And what, what helped me the, was the fact that the 
there was a college professor at FAMU who frequently visited St. Martin. Yeah. So I met him while he was here on vacation. Agreed. Um, so he basically, his wife, luckily, worked in the, the, the office where that deals with international students. Yeah. So she kind of fast-tracked my, <laughs> nice. my, uh, my, my application process yeah. and stuff. And I stayed with them um, for about a, a week upon reaching Tallahassee. But the interesting thing was um, while, I was hun- while I was hunting, um, she took me shopping and so forth. And I was like... Wow, I didn't know I had to buy pots. Yeah, I didn't like bed sheets. Yeah. you know, for me, I was like, okay, I get my apartment, and I was like, I, 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 I thank God that I had someone there to, like, yeah, you know, help me out because I, I didn't even think about, hey, you need to even even buy a um, uh, what do you call it, just cleaning utensils as well. Yeah, you know, for years, like, okay, you're gonna go into this apartment, get everything you need. Yeah, and so I, I, I like that you guys started that on foundation because whether. It's in the U.S. or in Holland or Canada because we have a lot of students in Canada too. Um, That training and acclimation is so important. Exactly. And, you know, here in in the schools, you don't have like in some schools in the States, we have like home economics and stuff like that where, you know, you kind of (laughs) learn some kind of um, um, functionality. So it was it was we really wanted to, um, you know, make it easier. Uh, Our projects committee wrote a student manual. Nice. Uh, that covered everything from moving up, registering for your BSN number, uh, shopping for your room or your apartment. Um, because, you know, you also have that, okay, you get this money, you go to Ikea, and it's very easy to yeah. get lost yeah. in Ikea. <laughs> and then you walk out, you man, I'm going to get this, and you walk out with 50 candles, and then you don't know what, <laughs> what you went for in the yeah, first place. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so the uh, it also covered um, something that really Im- impacts our students, and I think, you know, um, we always try to keep a focus on it, which is winter depression. Mm. Um, you know, even as an adult going to work, you know, to wake up, it's dark. You're at work, it's dark. You're leaving work, it's dark. You know, we are people of the sun. Mm-hmm. And um, whether you're white, black, whatever, whatever the level of melanin in your skin, you need the sun um, when you come from the Caribbean because that's what we grew up on. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, as students having to be put on, on vitamin D pills and everything. And in general, just that crushing, like... When will I see light again? Yeah, you know, kind of yeah. sensation, and um, and we heard a lot about that from students while we were up there, and so we felt it important to include that. Uh, the Netherlands has a lot of resources available uh, for mental health uh, support, so we listed that. Um, encourage students to you know be honest uh, with themselves about how they were feeling, and uh, because it also impacts your studies, and and you know then you don't do well in school, and then your depression w- worsens. And then it just becomes a cycle you don't get out of. True. So, yeah. So um, events like that, you know, to, to help bring that awareness. And that kind of also planted the seed of, you know, um, one day we might want to enter politics. Um, we had, you know, some committees within the organization uh, of, of bright, bright young professionals. Uh, some that, you know, have returned, some that have gone elsewhere, some that stayed in the Netherlands, uh, you know. And I love seeing them and, and the roles that they're in now. Um and yeah, it, the discussion about what eventually became PFP started while I was in the Netherlands uh, with myself and Cyril uh, and so Charlotte. So common to, uh, well, opposed to what I'm sure you've heard um, on the streets is that it's not your dad tr- giving you a party. Yeah, no, 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 it's not. Yeah, <laughs> And that's something that during campaign they asked me as well. And I said, you know, for, for the five years leading up to the launch of the party, um, I don't think he actually believed like, he never, you know, like, oh, that's nice. Like, he was like, I tell you, don't go into this thing. And um, I remember telling him in June 2019 that the launch is September 27th. And um, he said, the launch of what? I said, the party. What party? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so um, contrary to that, uh, in 2012, you know, we started the discussion up in Holland uh, of what we wanted to see um, for for the f- um, development of the political arena in St. Martin. So and that's, when you say we, that's um, most of um, the members you have. Yeah. Uh, well, that's myself. Uh, Cyril um, kicked it off and then um, Charlene as well later on and then Patrice and so forth. You know, just just reaching out to people that we, that, that, sounded like us basically mm-hmm. and not, not exactly like us but you have to kind of share there has to be the idea of a common goal and the common goal was improving St. Martin to a point where we we are a contender and we do reach our true potential uh, when it comes to you know our place in the region our place in the world um, and our place in the kingdom to be yeah. honest so uh, an yeah. interesting thing about that uh, which kind of created a bit of fear in the public even recently because after you guys launched you know there was basically the basically election um but what can you say about 
I guess even the process of you know uh, putting parts together, you guys went through a little uh, legal spat, I would say, um, in terms of um, being able to actually um, yeah. contend it. Um, yeah. So we announced the launch on the 21st of September, I believe. That was a Saturday before. Mm-hmm. Uh, Saturday, I think so. And the Facebook post went out. Every, you know, started getting feedback and everything. And then the Sunday or the Monday, boom, government fell. And we were like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, but at the same time, the, the, the common practice has been that the um, dates are shifted because there is no regulation for snap elections, really. Um, there is no, no, no mechanism, really, to, um, to regulate it. So the dates have usually been shifted, um, and that allows new parties to enter into the arena. That's, I believe, SMCP formed after the fall of a government, you know, and was able to contest. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. So that is the, the we, we wanted to challenge that, not because we were desperate to run or to participate, but because that's, that's all of a sudden now you're trying to lock out, you know. Um, so, yeah, um, it's fairness and uh, democratic process. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, we, we approached that in, in as professional a manner as we could, um, in mature manner as we could. And in the end, um, it ended up being adjusted that we, you know, uh, would be able to um, postulate because everything was there. Everything was already um, uh, we were incorporated. The uh, registration was sent a, to the council. council. Okay. Yeah, it was everything was already in process. So it's not that. And we what was your plan? Had elections been later on? The plan was what we announced at the launch, um, which was still to uh, do town hall meetings, do community outreach. It's interesting to see now that that was a priority of uh, you know the new um, party that was launched. But that is really how we wanted to approach it. That um, uh, take that time to glean that information from the public and to you know, even uh, co- execute some small projects that would be related to what we want to see happen on a larger scale. Uh, so all of that was the plan. And unfortunately, even if elections hadn't happened, you know, COVID would have stopped us from doing that anyway, at least for the first year. Um, but yeah, that was actually the goal um, to kind of mm. do that uh, uh, general education of the public with how a system works as well. Um, you know, the, the, the critical nature of a vote basically and how it is really the most precious thing that you um can do in your life because it it doesn't just set the tone for the for you know the four years of of parliament to government it's basically what happens in those four years has ripple effects that last through generations which we see now a good example of that really is the the referendum yeah in in 2000 because um we know what we were promised yeah (laughs) but when you look at what was delivered um now achieving the status you ask yourself well what would have been like have we voted differently yeah um but do you did you do you did you believe um from the beginning that you know pfp would have at least gotten one seat uh no because the two seats they come as a price of many yeah no, I didn't. And it's, um, so, you know, not that I was being pessimistic, but I was being realistic. Uh, we were at a point where in this country, you know, the political arena was at probably its most volatile. Um, there was a lot of stress, a lot of strain, the, the effects of, you know, the re- continuing effects of Irma. Uh, so for me, I said, you know, we have a very short campaign uh, time. Let's just, you know, make the best of it. We do what we can. And for me, I, I actually approached it as sort of a, a benchmarking exercise. You know, you see what you get and then, then you know how you can adjust yourself um, until the next election. But I did not, uh, even the day of, I think um, somebody interviewed me by Sister Marie Laurence <laughs> and said, um, yeah, uh, you know, how many votes do you think you're going to get, uh, Melissa? And I was like, oh, you know, I'll be very happy with 50. <laughs> you know, I'll be good with 50 because... Um, to get a vote is difficult, you know, if you are, if you're, if you're, um, my dad once said to me, if a hundred people tell you they're going to vote for you, chances are you got five votes swimming around in there, you know, because people will, human nature is you don't want to disappoint somebody. So people will say yes when really they're like, yeah, "Mm, yeah, probably not. Um, (laughs) And people can't actually share the same sentiment when he was here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so for me, um, I did not expect the, the, um, one seat, let alone two. Um, it was it was a very humbling experience. We were very surprised, and you know we approach that um, responsibility now with with all seriousness. Yeah, because uh, it's it's pretty interesting from a political, from an analyst type of uh, pr- perspective. Because um, one of the things I do for fun, <laughs> I'm a different guy, uh, so don't laugh at me, folks. One of the things I do for fun is I often compare or look at um, 
you know the 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 numbers of who's in who's who who is elected right now or yeah. appointed you know because it, it it's quite telling you know when you would see you know who maybe in the last two elections maybe witness a drop witness a rise yeah and you know that kind of helps you with with predictions of a of, of future election and so forth but i look at it from the um, standpoint of looking at um pfp mm-hmm. um you got you guys were a new party um you know, not necess- so it didn't necessarily have those the major financial backing that the larger established parties tend to have, new members, young professionals, and so forth. So um, those, you know, in your, let's say, age group, um, looking at some, you know, they came out and um, maybe, maybe, let's say, 100 and something votes, 200 and something votes. Uh, but from the jump, you had 520? I believe uh, 559 okay five 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 fifty nine. so um yeah. so that you know caught a lot of people off guard <laughs> they um, caught me off guard <laughs> yeah. uh, so I guess with, with, with that being said how do you now um is focus on you know ensuring that that promise that you made to people you know that yeah. um you're being as, as far as being a parliamentarian you know you're able to deliver because uh, people still feel like, you know, um, parliament doesn't work on their behalf. Yeah. Um, and, and so, especially looking at the last year, what would be your um, summary of, you know, uh, your party's performance? Yeah. I think um, this last year, we've kind of felt that we were sort of the fact checkers of parliament. Um, and that's also ties into what we did promise people in terms of representation, because there's a lot of misinformation that flows around um, you know, the sphere, whether it's it's on social media or whatever, but between government and parliament, sometimes I, I hear things and I'm like, that's really not how any of this works. Uh, that was very important to us last year th- to give people a reality check, um, especially with COVID and the ongoing effects of Irma to the economy. And, you know, I think we were accused by um, one MP of, of being very doom and gloom, but... You know, that just made me kind of laugh internally because it, it sounds very much like, oh, don't stop the carnival, you know, because sometimes it, you do have to take a pause. It has to stop and you have to kind of be real with people and be honest with people. Um, that's really what last year, a lot of it was dominated by the discussion of whether there should be conditions attached to money uh, coming from the Netherlands. Um, you know, are these conditions uh, fair? Uh, and, you know, what What do we want to see happen um, for the country moving forward so that we're not in a, in a situation again where we are literally dependent on anybody else, actually, whether it's the Netherlands or whoever, um, for just the money to keep the lights on. Because that's, that's the, the, the brink, the edge that we were at. And I, I think that nobody was very realistic with the people about that fact. Um, and I think that, you know, certain discussions uh, might have gone very differently had that honesty been there. And um, I understand that, too. You know, you, again, human nature is we don't want to deliver bad news, uh, especially when you're in politics and, and, and so much of your ability to keep the kind of going, um, you know, it, is needed for votes, yeah. you know, in the future. But for me, I said, um, I don't want the votes if they're just given um, in a false state of euphoria and, and the belief that, you know, things are great because that's that's really not the, the reality that we were facing at a certain point last year. And so um, I like that you mentioned um, the conditions and mm. stuff that Simon had to sign on to basically for liquidity support or, or loans. Um, but, you know, this whole matter with St. Martin and the Netherlands um, is a strained relationship that's yeah. been ongoing for some time. Um, <clears throat> like I often say, I think I, I really pinpointed from the moment that um, the screening instruction was given to St. Martin mm-hmm. and the Integrity Chamber. Yeah. Because that's why you kind of saw this intense back and forth between yeah. the two the two countries um so what what, what did you what one what, what, what for one, what is your party stance on you know um the ongoing conditions which yeah. we've seen from since um hurricane irma but also um our relation with the netherlands how can we improve that yeah because uh i don't think it would be f- it it would be very detrimental to the island you know to continue on a, on a basis where you have let's say a higher power that can twist your hand for that yeah. a better word yeah. you know um, because of your need yeah i think um it, it's gonna take a lot of effort and work on both sides um on on just yeah diplomacy in general uh and greater understanding you know when we were um 
at IPCO this year in one of my, and I think I, I talked about it a bit in Parliament, in one of my work group sessions, uh, the discussion of the relationship came up and you know, in with the Curacao Aruba and um, Netherlands representatives in that room, I said, you know, for for me, I look at it as the approach has become very much a uh, cold management style, which even in business is not something that is really adopted uh, anymore because it's proven not to get results. Um, I said I, I also think that there needs to be greater levels of cultural awareness and sensitivity um, in uh, interior affairs, so Bin Lanzazaka, uh, because in foreign affairs you won't really find that because they're accustomed to you know interacting with different cultures and different peoples uh, and different styles of working. And right now it's trying to copy-paste the management of how they handle uh, internal affairs in, in, in Netherlands between the Khamenei's and such to down here. But even up there, it causes chafing. You know, um, there is friction as well. If if you are, you know, with the time I spent in Holland, that's where I learned that, you know, it's not just we <laughs> that have this issue. Um, it's just a general lack of understanding, I think, of, of, of the realities that we face living in this region. Um, and it is going to take that understanding on both sides. On our end, I think that we, on the one hand, say, yeah, we understand that we haven't done things properly, but at the same time, try to be strong in that wrongness. And, and that, you know, our parents have always said, you know, your grandmother say you can't be wrong and strong. Uh, and that translates to your personal life and to um, business and, and, and politics. So I'm, I don't know what the fix is going to be. Uh, I do hope that it's, it, there's a level of openness and honesty with not just the people, but with themselves. Government has to um, undertake because that's also part of it. You know, um, admitting uh, that, you know, there have been missteps, et cetera, is one part of it. But you, you have to fully embrace that and then actually work towards um, making it better. Uh, I think, too, depending on the political players in Holland, it has also um, contributed to the de deterioration of the relationship. Uh, when you think about the fact that in that same work group session, um, the representative from Curacao said, you know, uh, in the time of, um, of Balkan and the Bailevelt, people that knew the islands that had actually come here, <laughs> you know, um, the relationship was not that strained. And that was Curacao's sentiment as well. And they have always been kind of looked at as, you know, the them in Aruba, like the, the favorite kids. Yeah. <laughs> so for them to also share the same uh, um, idea that I shared in that group was a little, uh, you know, a little bit of vindication um, to say that, oh, we're not crazy, you know, that it is it has gotten worse. Worse. And yeah. um, I think we'll see with, with some of the new faces um, in the Dutch uh, um, parliament that, you know, it, will, it might improve because I think the pressure is there to make it better, um, to, to approach it with a different uh, uh, outlook than what has been currently given. Of course, we have to wait for, you know, the actual new Dutch government to see what yeah, uh, correct. Well, it's really going to be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm my... I'm glad to see that at least uh, in the Twitter camera, it is there. The push is there that it, something has to change. Yeah, yeah. and then, and so um, so in addition to that, what do you say about yeah uh, the the conditions that yeah. you know that are placed on Saint Martin? At, at, at what point you know do we get to, um, get breathing space? I guess I would say. Yeah. Um, for me, I first of all, uh, the one condition that I really disagreed with was indeed um, the 12.5%. I don't think that uh, civil servants uh, should, you know, face any kind of punishment for the inactions of previous governments. Um, I think that a lot of the adjustments uh, are things that I probably would have done or wanted to have seen done anyway. Uh, when you think about the, the high salaries at certain government-owned companies, um, of management, etc. You know, sometimes I, I, I think that we forget that this is 16 square miles, um, you know, and that there is no, uh, there is no Microsoft, there's no Apple, you know, there's no, it, these are not huge corporations. So, you know, things have to be proportionate. Um, and I think that that's, that's something that I actually did not really have a, a, a complaint about. Um, for me, it was the 12.5% the because... Um, and you guys did propose um, the cutting of your salary? Yes. 
we propose that before the conditions because you know I, I think that's also part of it. That it didn't, I think um, part that of it didn't um, how to say come across well. No, I think improving the relationship also has to come from us recognizing that maybe we need to start taking some initiative when we see that things are are not gonna you know it's 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 very difficult to justify holding on to what you are making and what you are collecting um, and holding out your hand to help the people and not taking that step yourself. I felt after Irma, um, it probably would have been a better gesture of good faith for government to start looking at implementing some cuts, uh, you know, soon after the hurricane. Um, the same thing with COVID. We said, you know what, let's take the initiative and say we're willing to cut our salaries by 15% um, because we know that conditions are going to come. You know, when you're in a, in a relationship, it's it's doesn't look good that, uh, you know, if you're in a marriage or so, and after 33 years, you for, don't even know what type of flower your wife likes, you know? So you'd get in problems with that. And okay, it's, it's, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah it's kind of the same. It's kind of the same. Know, you know your partner. Um, you have to know your partner, basically. And I don't think that we uh, have yet gotten to that point. And um, for us, we were like, look, everybody is hurting. I come from private sector, so I automatically assumed the minute that COVID started to run wild in the States, uh, two plus two is four, you know, and I say, okay, well, chances are we're going to have to make a cut. So for me, I thought it was a no-brainer. Um, MP Peterson as well, uh, because that's what happens. Um, you have people in private sector still uh, struggling and not making what they were making um, pre-COVID. Uh, you know. Yeah, because that it, it did come across wrong, you know, to hear um, certain MPs speak about well, you know, they got they got used to the salary, so it kind of affects them and yeah, and their yeah, lifestyle and the cost of living. But it's like the, I said, the but population. I don't think a country has to has to <sighs> foot the bill for you living beyond your means. Maybe you know, that's also something that I I think the pandemic revealed, um, and I would want to see and and see what we can do as well from our end as a, as a faction and outside of that, as an association, um, to educate people a bit better on, on fiscal responsibility, um, you know, to, to find out that uh, people have strained themselves to the point where, you know, missing a paycheck is complete financial ruin. Uh, you don't want to hear that either. And that, you know, um, for people that, I, you know, we would think are, are upper middle class, etc., cetera, um, good jobs and such, it's just, it's just bad financial management. Even to when we look at um, over time, you had um, civil servants and also in private sector, a lot of people depending on overtime to cover basic bills. Um, that's not a reality you want either. And that boils down to cost of living. Uh, that it has not, you know, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's cause, cause, and disproportionate. Now we see good sky, skyrocket. And now it's going to skyrocket because, you know, now you're you're seeing the, the, the price increases on things like meat and, and, and pork and stuff that are going to come because they are always going to come. And it's just a little late, uh, you know, in, yeah, in the pandemic. What you say, just it just reminded me because, you know, I'm now thinking even uh, the time we entered into this new status is basically right after a global recession. Yeah. So let's say if things in the world picked up and did well, uh, let's say maybe 2012, yeah. but then from 2012 till 2007, 17, yeah. that's just five years, let's say, of, of a great period until we got here with Irma. Exactly. And right after, exactly. a little because breathing think, room yeah. and then COVID. Yeah, so we, we entered into the country status coming off the heels of um, the U.S. you know housing crisis and, and that had... A terrible impact on um, on us as a as a tourism destination. You know, I I was at uh, Sinesta Maho at the time, and it was made very clear to us that we had to everybody had to take a ten percent cut. Okay, it's either that or there's no job. That's the thing, and I think that that's the the level of honesty that um, we try to bring across to people uh, throughout the whole discussion last year. And I know it it's not a popular thing to say, but you know I don't believe I was elected to say popular things. I I want to be truthful with people, and say, look, this is the reality. Um, it's it's either a cut here or there's no job at all. And that that's a, that was a very real. Um, possibility for, for many people last year and still to this year, uh, you know, um, especially when you think about private sector. So I, I think that it's better to just um, have that, that sense of, oh, no, this is actually how it could go um, yeah. um, among you, around you at all times. Yeah. 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 So we, we, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back on that note. Cool. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome back to the news behind the news. Ralph Cantav on Mix 94.7 FM. And this afternoon, I'm joined with MP Melissa Gums, leader of the PFP 
Party for Progress. Um, so we last spoke about basically the conditions that yeah. um, Sim Martin had to agree to um, after Irma. But uh, my to continue on that note, do, do you find that um, these conditions and the laws that are that we, that were in a sense forced or passed compromises Parliament? Because um, yeah. I also would like to talk to you about the coho and the country package. Mm-hmm. Um, because with the coho, we barely get any information on what that is. Yeah. We have an idea, but you know, okay, we understand that there's discussions held with the government, but it's natural. It, it doesn't come out to the public really. Yeah. Um, and so, how is how is it uh, for you guys as, as parliamentarians? But again, do do you find that it, it compromises? our ability to, to lead ourselves. Yeah. I think um, the, un- the unfortunate reality is, yes, it, 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 it does. Um, I don't like that we are being, you know, that we're told about reforms that we should have been able to make on our own. Uh, ten years as a country, and a lot of the, the things that are in the country package even have been in government, governing programs since 10, 10, 10. And, you know, there's been no movement on them. And it's kind of like, you know, I know I have this homework to do, but I haven't done it. And now I'm being forced to do it before I, you know, can uh, turn on the PlayStation or so. But um, for us, it's also a little unclear where we stand. I mean, we get uh, the implementation agendas and such, but um, how it's actually going to be executed is still a, a question for me. One of the things... Uh, so, yeah. Sorry, just a brief interjection. Um, yeah, because I, I, I remember, I think, your party also translated the yes. country package. We translated the country package, um, the version that we received, I think, earlier this year, when it was, I think it was a bit more fine-tuned. Um, there have still been adjustments made in terms of the execution of it, and um, uh, but that one we translated so that people could actually download it from the website and read it. Uh, and maybe, you know, it didn't go in, into full detail, but at least you would have an idea of what's, um, what's coming, what's potentially coming. Uh, there were some things in there that really caught the um, eye of some MPs, uh, the land tax, uh, the VAT, for example, um, you know, and tax reform in general. And those are the, the, the tax reform is something that we've had a meeting uh, with the Minister of Finance about that, yeah. cr- that caused the whole ruckus yeah, about uh, the, the real estate tax yeah. um, on imported um, items, Correct. ordered online items. Correct. Uh, but there's other things as well that, you know, um, we would like uh, to see a bit more information coming out about it. I think there's actually going to be some meetings planned, uh, uh, a request that I signed on to um, with MP Westcott and MP Boncamper about... Um, the status of these uh, projects across ministries. Because, you know, um, the prime minister, as the government, um, you know, g- official sort of um, handler, of the leader of the country, um, she is usually the one that is delivering the, the updates and such. But for the other ministers, we would like to be able to get into the nitty gritty of what yeah, is, you know. Basically, especially when it comes to the, the liquidity, um, the information we got is okay. Well, um, the Ministry of Justice, the Ministry of VSA, or this other ministry, um, they had some um, work to do yeah. in order for us to um, get the liquidity, yeah. what is a six, fifth trans, etc. But it's like, what exactly is the changes that have to be done yeah and it's that detail is, is really missing yeah and that's 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 the purpose of the upcoming meetings and they will be on um, central committee meetings so it will be there for the public to uh, to view mm-hmm. um, they will be broadcast and and to get that information as well uh because it's it's a lot it's a lot of work you know reform yeah. in general is is a very tedious process if when done correctly um but you have to hit your deliverables and for us um, we spent a lot of last year hearing and previous years as well that there's no capacity in government for, for certain uh, projects, for certain uh, reform projects that they wanted to carry out or that should be carried out. So now my, my question is basically, how are we going to fill that capacity yeah. now? Uh, how, yes, and how, do, how, will we, yes. how will the money execute it? If and how will the money, um, you know, for the coho, how will the money be handled? So... It would be strange if we have to borrow money to, to pay for No, them. but, but a, a question <laughs> I have is like, imagine, um, mm-hmm. imagine in education or, uh, you know, any ministry, they need technical support, which is, which is possible, requesting technical support. And you request and you are, you are you know, granted um, two civil servants uh, from the Dutch uh, counter ministry of whatever ministry we're talking about. 
Well, how does that work out from a budgetary perspective? Are we seconding people? Um, you know, is are they going to sit on the budget up there, but then also be compensated? Like how you know? Yeah, so those yeah. are the little fine the minute pretty. details yeah. that um, I would like to know because you don't want to get caught in that um, in that trap either. Uh, you know, where th that's unclear. Um, and in general, just how are we going to be able to execute things on time? And one of the things I expressed at Ipco with, um, along with Aruba, um, so a representative from Aruba is. Are we going to be in a situation where because capacity prevented us from meeting a deliverable uh, that now we have to get into this whole, oh, but please still grant us the support, uh, the financial support then to cover whatever. Or an instruction. Yeah, because you don't want to end up in that, in that situation either because it's, it's known that, there's, that the capacity is lacking. So, you know, kind of, um, I think the word I used was that the country is not held hostage because of a failure um, within government or or whatever to actually um, execute. Yeah, because I, I don't understand that. Um, one of the things the government did um, challenge the Netherlands about, which, from what I last understood, is I guess like I kind of agreed upon is the the deadlines that are set. Yeah, that they are actually realistic. Yeah, yeah. No, that's very important, and I, I agreed with that as well. That um, it it you know you have to again be realistic, be honest with yeah. yourself. Uh, and I'm glad to see that government took that step because, uh, you know, it was it's very easy to also say, oh, yeah, we can definitely do it within three months. But it's it takes much um, touch marks, more gravitas to say, no, I can't. And this is the time that I actually need yeah. to be able to execute. Because what, what you said about the um, the capacity, having a capacity reminds me, I must say, uh, of an interview the former minister of finance, Richard Gibson, did. I remember that interview clearly when he spoke about the evolution of revolution <laughs> in relation to St. Martin. But it was very interesting. I really recommend people to, to listen to it. Why? Because um, he was the first minister that I heard publicly state that a lot of the hires in government, um, or, or, or too much in a sense, um, you know, are questionable as far as um, you would have persons working in departments and, and unable to do the job that, yeah. that they had to do, yeah. which means that you're paying that person and you're paying uh, consultants. Exactly. And, 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 so, and when you would inquire about, you know, well, how did you get his job as well? You know, yeah. uh, through some sort of political favor. So you see where the you know, decisions that we make in the past out of whatever motive yes. hampers a country. Yeah. Because definitely, yeah, and 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 at a time like this where we know, for example, I'm pretty sure, cutting down on on on, on paying for consults, consultancy, cons consultancies, and so forth, it's like you know, the, depending on on your civil core. And this is not saying that everyone working at government building or majority of civil servants Precisely. can do the job. Yeah. <laughs> that's just uh, made a disclaimer. But basically, you have persons still. Um, employed who are unable to do their jobs. Yes, and people p and persons in critical positions because that's also part of it is is you know if you have um any any one any unproductive um element in any department or organization is is you know going to uh, be a detriment um in the long run but you don't want to see that happen um in higher uh, um, percentage amounts at the at the highest level basically uh because if your critical functions are compromised like that um it'll be it'll take that much longer for you to actually bounce back uh, then you're putting the burden on the ones, the underlings, so to speak. Correct. At the same time, still needing to rely, rely on consultants to um to actually get the work done. Correct. But that's, again, that's, you know, some people may say, well, that's a cultural thing or so. But at, at some point, I have to ask, at what point do we um yeah, but do we let go of yeah, that yeah, concept? Yeah, yeah, because you know? everyone, every nation has their culture and cultural traits. But... Not every cultural trait is, is positive. Exactly. You know, we have good things that we do and we have bad things that we exactly. do. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so, I in addition... Oh, so go ahead. You know, and I think that um, that period of, like, internal reflection really needs to happen because, you know, it's 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 been um, talked about publicly, etc., you know, of, of workers that go on sick leave uh, for a year, but are they really sick, you know, and those kinds of, um, those kinds of discussions. Correct. And it's... There's been no kind of performance uh, management, really, um, when you think about it, and I'm I'm hoping that that you know um, putting those kinds of things in place is going to kind of streamline and and, and reveal maybe where some um, adjustments need to be made, yeah, to make sure that that the 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 hires that do get in 
are, are what we actually need to move the country forward. Correct. Yeah. So um, in addition to that, uh, what, what, what are some of the items on the PFP's legislative agenda? Yeah. And ask that to um, also add in that, you know, what do you guys realistically see yourself accomplishing? Because, you know, that is a criticism Parliament always gets. Yeah. It's, and I mean, it's, it's, it's a valid criticism at the same time that is, uh, that is kind of tempered by the fact that, you know, um, from a legislative perspective, uh, we are very weak off um, in terms of, of legislative capacity, uh, not just as parliament, but government as well. And indeed, um, I, I remember having a conversation with uh, an Aruba MP who said that, yeah, they also have that struggle. Uh, you know, we, but the good thing is you have that uh, the course now uh, through the University of Curacao um, where you can uh, do a legislative writing course. Uh, and and it strengthens then your capacity on that, and then we do have some simatinas I think that are yes um, pending graduation yeah uh, from that and uh, so the, um there's a majority of the Simartin graduates are top students actually yeah yeah exactly so and I'm looking forward to that and to seeing what they can then um um contribute you know because it's it's everywhere the Aruba MP told me they tried to find somebody even in Holland and they had an issue getting someone who was able to do that work uh, for them you know um and that was as a consultant. Uh, so it's definitely not a, a, a localized struggle um, only is what I mean to say. Uh, for us, we um, have been looking at making uh, certain amendments. Uh, I don't like to um, say a lot about it because I think that uh, because of that legislative uh, dearth that we have, you know, the, the lack of capacity, when you talk about things, people generally expect to see it in a month, you know, or two. Um, but that's not realistic. Uh, right now, what we are doing is we're um, in the research uh, phase, basically. Um, I'm sure that you'll uh, remember that we had sent a request uh, to the Prime Minister to ask the SER to look into the proliferation of lottery boots uh, on the island because I think that uh, tackling the gambling situation is something that, you know, is, is near and dear to my heart. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that <laughs> it's already come gone to a point beyond for a 16 square mile uh, yeah, cause piece I, of land. I'll, I'll, I'll add just a bit in that because um, I remember speaking to uh, the director of Turning Point and they also mentioned that yes. um, so beyond dealing with people who are addicted to drugs yes. and so forth, that they've been helping people who would have maybe been addicted to gambling. Yes. I think sometimes we don't think that it is something you can get Precisely. addicted to. Yeah, and, it, and, and anything, anything um, in excess in life yes. can lead to, um, to addiction, you know, if you have that, 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 that a personality in, in that, that fits that. Uh, and I noticed uh, two, two, three days ago, uh, there was a statement from government that they will be looking into the increase in lottery boots, which is interesting um, because, you know, the research was already requested um, from the SER uh, to kind of um, regulate how those are handled right now. Uh, you know, I, I have said it publicly that to me, uh, the biggest mistake we ever made was moving from a hotel being required to have a casino to standalone casinos. Um, in terms of the, the, the proximity to our educational institutions, you know, um, yeah. the dust up with Rouge Noir, and even in my own neighborhood, across from System Marie Laurence, you have a lottery boot now. And uh, the school is closed, but the basketball court is there, the playground is there. Yeah, but it's there. still, yeah, it's the, still the image. A, it's yeah. still a community space Correct. for children. Correct. Um, you know, so that's something that we are looking into and what, what, how, what, how can the, the gambling, the existing ordinances be strengthened? Uh, not everything requires a new law. A lot of people... Uh, ask, well, what, ra what laws are you writing? And sometimes the law is not needed. The law is there. It's just that there's an amendment maybe needed to update it, uh, to bring it... Because that um, tends to be the loophole. Yes. We have a lot of old laws. Exactly. Uh, to bring it in line with, you know, um, modern reality. Uh, so that um, is some of the research that we're working on right now. Okay. Um, to see, you know, where 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 can we strengthen... When, where can society be strengthened, basically, without having to go through the entire process of creating a new law? Okay. Yeah, because yeah, uh, yeah, the process of creating the law uh, is long. Yeah, could take up to eight eight months to a year. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's that's good. Um, that's on the good end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but in addition to that, uh, one of the initiatives I saw that PFP um, launched was the request with Teen Times to yeah. um, get Simon history in a school's curriculum. Uh, so what is the status on that? And can you give so, background uh, before, on why? So before before the summer that? recess, I had sent a. Uh, Request to MP Angelique Romu, who is the chairperson of the Committee for Education, Culture, Youth and Sports, 
uh, the permanent committee then, because uh, that's the purpose of those committees. It's to kind of uh, use them as an investigative body uh, to find out more about a topic. Um, you know, the, the meetings are really working meetings where you kind of dig deep and it's, it can go back and forth. We've had some great exchanges with ministers, with other organizations that come in for committee meetings. So the request is there. Uh, but then we had recess, of course. And um, now that we are back, I do believe she told me that she's working on planning it. Uh, we have had some um, crit critical meetings that needed to be completed uh, to get them off of the docket, basically. But I, it is in the planning. And um, I think uh, next week is a preparation week and a training week. So I will follow up as well with her to see, you know, where we're at with that. Because okay. she has to plan a meeting and then we can go from there. Okay, because in addition to that, what, one of the things I would add is that, you know, we do have a lot of St. Martin books. Yeah. A lot of good books written about St. Martin that could easily be used as material, whether yeah. for social studies, literature, yeah, um, well, yeah uh, even geography classes. Yeah, and you have you have um, um, people, you know, wonderful teachers that I had the privilege of being taught by uh, Miss Napolina Richardson, yes. Linda Ria van Enkevoort, yeah. you know, who have Great written lines, yeah. and have uh, 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 taught Simatin, you know, history and, and, and social studies basically to to students um, going through the system. And I think, look, at the end of the day, uh, it's just to find out what has been, because I know that it was proposed a couple of years ago, um, you know, to have like a week or so uh, committed across the schools to um, local history and building it into the curriculum. But I'm not sure where that initiative went. So mm -hmm. those are the kind of questions that, you know, I hope to get answered um, in this committee meeting. Uh, and then to kind of see, yeah, also to get the minister's input as to what does he envision then um, that would look like. You know, you have, uh, unfortunately, I think that we kind of let education kind of, you want to set up a school board? Yeah, go ahead. You know, kind of <laughs> um, situation without really setting uh, rules even for that. You know, that, um, no, you can have, you know, your uh, specific school board or, or system or whatever, but this has to be incorporated some way, shape or form um, into that. Uh, so that everybody, whether you're going to St. Dominic or whether you're going to MPC or whether you're going to LU or, whatever, or academy, or definitely. academy, has to get that um, that introduction then to to yeah. local history. Yeah, because I mean, uh, I thank God for like teachers like Miss Pratt. Um, shout out to all academy students. <laughs> Don't feel away. Um, you know, Mr. Cook, etc. Who would you know, uh, Miss Wano? We had teachers at least who would bring in persons to, to speak yeah. to us about St. Martin's history or on the, their own initiative would, would tell us stories they've heard, yes. um, bring books um, that are, you know, that are not part of the curriculum yeah. and teach us. Exactly. You know, because another thing that we have is that, and, and um, we have a lot of teachers who are not from here. Um, and so I think it's also important that they go through a, a course exactly. or training yes. that they too can teach, yeah. you know, St. Martin students about St. Martin. Yeah. Um, it's common, you know, we have people who, who teach English English as a second language and other places and so forth. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just, it's, it's so important because even as when you look at it from a political perspective, nation building and stuff, if your people don't know their history, yeah. how can you stand on the global stage? Yeah. You know, because th you have to carry with you um, the knowledge, the experiences of, of persons, you know, who helped shape the, the nation that, that, that you call home, that yeah. you're part of. Exactly. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So, so it's it's definitely something that we um, will continue to follow up on, and mm -hmm. and once that meeting is called, I, I do hope that everybody, uh, you know, especially Teen Times, tunes into it, um, to to at least follow it along, and because it's important too that everybody remains part of the process. Yeah. Um, you know, and that it's not just one, uh, because that's something too that I I am a, a, a strong proponent of, and one thing that, uh, both Miss Richardson and Miss Van Enkevoort um taught me. Which is that, you know, um, there are varying sides to every story in history. Yeah, that is true. Yes. And, and it cannot just be told from one um, um, perspective. And you have to really look at the bigger picture. That is true. That's, that's something that I have always enjoyed about, um, about their classes and about um, learning about history in, in general. And so. I, I, I'll use this opportunity to plug in um, Millie XXM, <laughs> our <laughs> podcast about St. Martin history. Uh, shout out to Carla, Jonathan, and Steffi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, in, in addition to that, um, one of the things, there's two things I would like to touch on, which was um, one being the colonization. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is about that, you know, it tends to be a, it's a hot topic here and there. So it's, there's, there's no like consistent, yeah. I think, conversation about it. But uh, before I get to that, um, recently uh, with the meeting 
about um, Romy and the Longleast land. You guys uh, basically launched the motion of disapproval, you know, relating to the handling of that situation. Um, can you share um, some insight on that? But also, um, how would you address, you know, concerns people tend to have where, you know, part, where, where you use the parliament giving up motions, mm-hmm. but will something be done? Yeah. Uh, so one of the resolutions that um, was included in that in that motion was that within uh, three months, the minister has to return with an update in, a, in another public meeting on what work has been done. I think setting that um, that deadline uh, is critical. It's something that we plan to follow up on and to ensure that it's actually planned, that meeting. Um, because a lot of times, you know, the motion contains resolutions, but it's kind of just, okay, go ahead now. And there's no, like, I like to have, you know, we like to have timelines um, for, 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 for feedback and for follow-up. Uh, three months, I think, it was sufficient. Um, so that is the deadline that we gave. And, yeah, the idea for us is to um, monitor whatever updates. If the minister feels like sharing updates along, you know, those three months, that's perfectly fine. Um, but if not, then to still follow up and make sure that that meeting is planned. I think we had the date of where it would kind of be pinned down, but I can't remember it off the top of my head right okay. now. Hold on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think that is really, um, look, follow up is, is, is key to everything. Yeah. If you, you just give something, you just say an instruction, give an order or whatever, and you don't actually make sure that it, it, it's been uh, executed, you're always going to end up with, um, what they like to call empty motions, you know, that, um, sound nice and it looks as though people are working, but it's just, uh, nothing actually comes out of it. So it is my hope that, um, everything that we put in there is taken seriously and, uh, that in three months time. Uh, when we get that date, I'll share it with you because I when I check it, because um, I can't remember it right now. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that uh, yeah, that we we have something tangible at least uh, in front of us yeah. when the minister comes back. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so um, also concerning the time I've left, I, I guess I'll end up on this topic. <laughs> but decolonization. Yeah. Um, you know, decolonization uh, is a. Um, uh, a matter of concern, you know, to St. Martin, just because of our history. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, many feel that the way in which the whole topic was brought across, uh, looking at um, the UN petition, even the meeting, the Cho Harris meeting in Parliament, yes. um, even just the information that was, that was shared um, was done in a manner that was uh, simply question, questionable. Yeah. Um, so what, what is your party stance on decolonization? And the way in which St. Martin can, you know, just further become a true autonomous or self, self-sustaining self um, nation. Yeah. I think um, for us, we've made it clear that the, the while the discussion is important, it's not so much a discussion that I, uh, that we think would have been, should have been shoehorned in now at this current time. Because, you know, um, it came across very much like, well, they, we don't like this status, so we want to look for something new. Uh, and to be honest with you, we have um, someone said it. Said it, someone said it to me, and I thought it was a very good statement. So I'm gonna borrow it from them. Um, we're always running away from something. Hmm. Uh, at the end of the day, not to mince words, we ran away from the Netherlands Antilles because we run away from Curacao. Uh, the relationship, and and you know, uh, if you talk to people who are from Aruba from back in the day, they can tell you it was, has always been very. Uh, lopsided the, the relationship, even though they are comparable in size, population, it was always very much the Kyrgyz Kyrgyz was a giant, yeah. Um, so you know, the person said to me, you know, we're running away from Kyrgyzstan, and then uh, we ran into this status to get away from that, and then we put up in, you know, another boogeyman, and said, well, no, now we want to run away from that, but at a certain point in time, you're going to run and hit a wall, uh, and I, I, I think that um, the. The reality is that we should we need to first make this status work, uh, at least make an attempt, because let's be honest, we have not. Um, the fact that these reforms that we should have been working on even before becoming a country are yeah, now that's, that's being point. forced on us based in a sense, you know, that we're being made to do that homework now. Um, the homework is 11 years too late. So I cannot justify even the the because I know how conversa- it, it, it it starts off as we just want to talk about it, but in reality you can hear through the language that the push is there um, for what I don't know because it's still very unclear to me. We've heard varying statements. I think the 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 weirdest one was that um, a fully autonomous nation within the kingdom, but that you cannot be within and without at the same time because that's essentially what that is. Um, at the end of the day, fully autonomous is independent. 
And I don't think that that is, while that is something that I think many people envision and, and dream for the country, I think, again, it's about looking at the reality of um, not just our own situation here locally, but the reality of the world. You know, the, the, the Caribbean itself is a very different region than it was in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, when, other, when our neighbors were basically um, obtaining or pushing for um, their independence. And even now, uh, we see that they, too, are engaging in agreements with, you know, European countries, uh, China, etc., uh, because it's, it, the reality is that very seldom do you go it alone in this world whether you're a small island uh, developing state or you are a, a major country. Um, there are partnerships to be had everywhere. And we've not yet learned how to um, function and be solid partners in our current constellation. So a, a lot of what I hear about, well, when you're helping a country, you don't put conditions on the money, is very strange to me because, indeed, if you look at the IMF, if you look at the World Bank, if you look at China... Um, Taiwan, if you look at the United Arab Emirates, it, it always comes with a condition. Uh, um, not only that it comes with a condition, it tends to be so cutthroat. Yeah. I mean, had, and, and I think that the, the current president of the central bank said it too when he, in his first meeting with parliament. When he was asked about whether or not we could have gone to the IMF, he said yes, but I can guarantee you, having come from that environment, the conditions would have been worse. Would have been, more, would have been even more strict. Um, and I think that that is, is, is something that I've also tried to communicate from a, from a geopolitical reality that we need to really um, have that conversation first. Like what, what do we want our place to be um, in this region uh, and in the world? And, and, you know, I think that that is still a conversation we can have while within this constellation. Because um, when you get down to brass tacks, uh, Ralph, um, we don't communicate well with even the French side. <laughs> or Aruba and Curacao, or Seba and Stacia. It's, it's, it's in times of crisis that we talk, but what happens outside of that? And until we can come to a point where that flows well, I don't think we need to entertain um, the, the idea of running away again from a different boogeyman because the ones that we're going to put up in after that, it's, uh, it's a whole new ball game. So in essence, yeah, yeah face, face what we have. Yeah. Yeah, because um, I think, you know, of course, and it's natural that we... Uh, like you look at Barbados, which is now becoming a republic. Um, Still within the Commonwealth, because that's the thing. There's also misinformation about that. People are like, yeah, they're finally kicking them. And I'm like, they're not actually doing this. They're republics within the Commonwealth. It's how it, that's how it works. Yeah, yeah. So, so you see where, in essence, you know, um, as I think the, the underlying thing you mentioned is that um, the Caribbean of the of the 70s, 80s, 60s is different from, from what it is today. But uh, another bottom line is that uh, we have to be careful what we run into because indeed China, the IMF, the world, I mean, we've seen it with delays with the World Bank alone. Mm -hmm. So imagine having to deal with them only. Um, basically says that, you know, I think St. Martin should really focus on building itself up. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Any, final, any final words from you, MP? Uh, no, thank you again for having me. Um, you know, it was a great discussion. I'm always happy to, to, to share, you know, what, um, what our thoughts are. And these are the types of conversations that I want to see, you know, take place in the public, uh, public domain because um, that level of engagement as well in, in, in what is happening in politics outside of elections is also important. You know, and that's, that too is, is, is part of the difference I talk about with um, when you look at uh, islands like St. Kitts, Dominica, etc. Their population is always very engaged politically, also outside of campaign season. So I would urge, you know, everyone, um, everyone listening or watching that, you know, the, the, the time to talk about it in, in, in a professional, mature way isn't just uh, those, <laughs> two, those two months or so, those six weeks before you have to um, go to the polls. Yeah. Indeed. So. Uh, thank you so much. And to our viewers and listeners, I uh, hope you enjoyed this conversation. Do take care. All right.